So I have the pleasure of introducing Morgan for our last discussion hour of the semester. Uh, Morgan is a second year graduate student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. It really shows Earth and Planetary here for this talk, so that's something nice to celebrate. Um, and she is working with Tim Gouge and Joel Johnson. From interiors to alien processes, she is interested in planetary surfaces and landscapes and the ways geomorphology can be utilized to understand the evolution of surfaces across the solar system. So with that, let's welcome Morgan. It's so great to see y'all. I love you, Tango. Come and visit. It's always a great time. Um, and so basically, like Makita said, love a good surface, love a good process. Um, but this project kind of focuses on, like, I guess the culmination of my grad work is focusing on amphitheater headed canyons, which are very specific to like fluvial processes um, and like a very specific type of river valley that I'll get into. Um, they're on Earth and they're on Mars, but this project is mostly just a bunch of really cool, pretty, pretty pictures from field work I did in September. Um, kind of a reconnaissance trip to figure out, like, okay, we're going to study these, but like, how do you study them in the field? Like, what are we going to do and how are we going to apply them? And so, the pretty, pretty pictures come at the end. So, you just kind of have to bear, <laughs> bear with me for a little bit. Um, and so, amphitheatic canyons are a specific type of canyon, specifically a river valley with deeply entrenched canyon heads, deep walls, and curved platforms. And so they occur all over kind of the surface of the earth, um, such as in Hawaii, which these are very large versions of these. Um, they've been observed in Idaho. This is Box Canyon. Um, but it's really their morphology and their plan form that kind of, and their association with smaller scale staffing channels. So staffing channels are largely formed by groundwater subsurface flow. Um, I think it's, I just recently learned this word, hyperpignal flow. So basically like when the water, you know, hits the surface, this is a beach on the right side. I took this picture <laughs> um, and wanted to include it, but um, this is a beach on the right side. And so you, as you have like waves and things hitting the shore of the beach, um, you have the flow of the water like going into the sand, super permeable uh, sand grains. And as you have the water kind of draining down the slope towards the, you know, the, what do you call it? Like the shoreline, I guess, where the water is. Um, it kind of starts to form this like erosional pattern. And if you look very closely, uh, kind of whoops, at the top, where the, like at the top of where the pen is for scale, um, they have these like very pointed, like edgy, like they kind of start out of quote unquote nowhere. And you can see that kind of percolate down towards the end of the picture. And so, they look very similar. I guess the top of the image on the right, on the left hand in Hawaii is to the bottom left hand corner. And so they're kind of flipped opposite to each other. And so it was the, that kind of association that they had with these small sail sapping channels and their like general morphology that really drove them to associate um, these channels with like the same similar processes of groundwater um, and groundwater interactions and forming these kinds of uh, channels. Um, but then came early orbital images of Mars. Uh, and so on the left, you can see very similar um, images from Viking, the Viking mission that returned back um, some of the first images of Mars. And they found similar uh, canyon morphologies on Mars. And that really drove the understanding of, because groundwater has large implications for uh, biospheres and things like that, and past planetary habitabilities on Mars. Um, it really drove this need to understand exactly what's happening in these canyons, what forms them, and what that means for past planetary, past, past planetary habitability specifically for Mars. Um, and the resolution of these images has only gotten better. And so on the right, that's the image of Nervo Vallis. And you see that they're very similar to the sapping channels, very similar to what we see on Earth. Um, and so it was kind of a need to figure out what's going on across all you know, surfaces, both Earth and Mars, to really constrain, is it groundwater? How much groundwater? What does this mean? Um, for biospheres and things like that. And so because of their association on Earth with sapping channels and groundwater sapping, it was kind of like first proposed early in 1985 by Lady and Malin that these are also associated on um, Mars with groundwater sapping. And that was a really big, uh, like I've been mentioning about past planetary habitability, that was a very large 
a proposed proposition, I guess. Um, but as a better understanding of Mars has come into play uh, with like general, you know, processes and things on Mars, it's kind of been understood that it's likely that Mars is more basaltic in lithology. And so with harder lithologies like that, it's a lot more difficult to get groundwater percolating through things and forming these massive canyons that are three up to three kilometers, two kilometers in depth. Um, and so came the other side of the spectrum, which is surface runoff. And so just for a little understanding of what these both look like. So you see seepage and you see kind of, can you see my mouse? Oh, great, incredible. <laughs> um, so if you imagine some runoff here, like is just, uh, depicted here. If you have, you know, surface runoff happening, you're getting erosion of this space here and kind of head wall retreat this way, um, where that's like the dominant form of propagating the head wall back. But with seepage, you have, you know, the groundwater table kind of hitting this aquaclude here, which I'll get into in a second, um, and causing undermining. So you're eroding more at this surface than you have at this surface, causing this not to be undermined and therefore collapsed as you know things get weaker and it's no longer supported um, at the base, you get a uh, head wall retreat that way. And so I mentioned the aquaclude because throughout all of this has been mentioned the need for lithology, like how does lithology fit into this? And harder lithologies can get groundwater percolating and um, forming these like massive canyons in the same way that you would with surface runoff. And so this is kind of an image of Amphithe like the so in certain regions like in southeastern Utah per se you have more sedimentary soft um uh lithologies and so you get strong permeable sandstones atop weak impermeable layers and forming that aquaclude so you're forcing kind of the ground like the groundwater to be focused at, at the contact between those two because it can no longer permeate down far enough past the impermeable layer. And so that forces that like undermining to be really focused at that point and all the erosion to be really focused at that point uh, versus, you know, basalt, if you have differences in litho lithology difference be differences between basalt, like how does that look like? What does that look and how does that feed into either enabling or inhibiting groundwater flow and subsequent uh, surface runoff? So there's a lot of questions, a lot of things, like I mentioned a lot of things and a lot of who knows and what's going on because it's all largely proposed, but very, very loosely constrained. And so we know that there's groundwater and we know that there's surface runoff, but like where those really sit on that larger spectrum and natural systems, which is really probably what's happening. You have some combination of the two um, and where lithology fits into that as either a boundary control or a larger process that's enabling things is really not well understood. And so I'm largely interested in how those, like what conditions are necessary, like absolutely baseline, you have to have this happening in order to get formation and which are sufficient. So like what's an added bonus that like really makes them larger or makes them, you know, cooler, I don't know, what the, whatever, <laughs> whatever word you want to fill in. Um, so like really looking at which ones dominate and when they do dominate and what if they do dominate, what does that mean for the morphology of the canyon? And even furthermore, looking at can the canyon morphology that we see, so these like on Mars, we know that surface water activity was like three billion years ago, a very long time ago. What does that mean for looking at these canyons now after all of this, you know, settling of things and aeolian processes that really dominate Mars? What does that mean for using these canyons and their morphologies to constrain the relative roles? So can we use these canyons to understand, you know, oh, it was groundwater or oh, it was surface runoff that dominated. And if that if that's possible, like what does that mean for rock properties? Do you need that strong over weak aquaclude type scenario to really propagate things? And is all of that information recorded in these canyon morphologies? And if so, can we use them to reconstruct paleo environments? And so we took, again, to Colorado Plateau. Um, this is like Southeastern Utah. Um, it's a very large expanse of land. There's Capitol Reef, National Park on the like 
let's see, never eat shredded meat, Western <laughs> side. Um, and then you have. <laughs> Can you play on some Wait, repeat that? Yeah. Never eat shredded meat? I've never heard of that. Hmm. I've never, never saw you order. Never eat soggy waffles is the one that I've heard. I heard another one, but I should say that off recording. <laughs> it's, uh, sorry to catch all off guard. <laughs> Uh, never you like me. All right. Um, so we like a bunch of national parks happening, which makes you know field work quite difficult for getting permits for flying drones, which I've been talking about. Um, but these are kind of where we focused our efforts, looking at because this is such a treacherous terrain, and because things are quite spread out, and it's difficult to get into these kilometer size, you know, large canyons. It was really a focus of. This trip was really a focus of like, where can we get to? And it need be like, how do we get here to these places? You know, it's quite a hike, it's quite remote and we camped most of the time we were out here. So it was a question of like, how do we get to these things? Can we get to them when using, you know, roads and vehicles and things? And so we started in Hans Flat, which is right outside of Canyonlands National Park, which is a great place. So cool, <laughs> really would recommend going. These are, uh, these are drawn pictures, but they're not as cool. It doesn't look as cool up here. That's fine. <laughs> um, these are drone pictures. This is the only place we got like cool, cool drone pictures mm -hmm. because of permitting things and national recreation area things. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of one of the canyons we were looking at and able were able to get to. And so what you're looking at is the Navajo sandstone, which is the stronger permeable layer. So you know, assuming that that's a necessary and sufficient thing to, you know, have in these settings um, is the top layer and then the cliff forming layer that you see. And then you have the slope layer under it, um, which is getting into the Kayenta, um, I think it's primarily mudstones, I don't know, Kayenta formation, which is primarily mudstones and it composes that like weak impermeable layer. And so you really see this like, amphitheater head, you know, plan form, kind of from like a side down view. Um, but it's really when you get at this view that you see this like massive amphitheater head, but it is not very obvious from the pictures that like I was looking at. So I've like been working for a little while, like looking at these on Mars, on Earth and on Mars. Um, this is not at all captured in like plan form. And I don't know if y'all can see the same, but like looking from the top down, like remote sensing view, I couldn't have guessed that this is what it looked like. Um, and so you see very well, there's like a plunge pool. So you can see like that like kind of streaky red layer at the top is the Navajo sandstone. The red stuff below it is the Kayenta formation. So strong over weak. And at that exact point of contact, which I think is an exact point of contact, to be debated. <laughs> Don't take, take that with a grain of salt. Um, where you see kind of white flaky stuff at and like the garden, like there's a couple vegetated layers here. So right here, that's kind of where the contact is and likely where there was seepage at one point or is currently seepage, who knows, to be determined. Mm -hmm. But you really see the what the logic difference is as you go down and you get to this highly vegetated point here. And then if you look really closely, that's water. Which is really cool. I didn't expect to see water there. It's not groundwater, like a spring. Uh, it's groundwater. Okay. Um, so it was actually coming out of. We managed to get down to this canyon with rock climbing and lots of. Oh my God! Please, like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and like helping each other out. It was quite a. It was quite a, a journey. But it's um actually focused in here. Like, there's a little where you see like most of this vegetation. And it's like super green, which is not what you expected. Southeastern Utah, where there's like very little rain at this time of the year. Mm -hmm. um, there was a little like a uh, seepage area here. Um, and so we also saw like hoof prints where there were like cows and such. So there's like, they were just trying to find water, and I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a lot of really cool stuff in this area. But what I was not expecting to see was that like massive alcove, which is what is best described by this, where you have like things like they call them hanging gardens where you'll get like, you know, an accumulation of vegetation where the seepage is most concentrated, which given like, you know, the little splays of vegetation here and going down further, um, it was very obvious that there was seepage 
at some point or there is seepage there or it's not like super concentrated not quite sure but it was really cool and i was not at all expecting it um also the plunge pool which is like there's like sandy stuff at the bottom and like just there was a lot going on but and also where this water is there was like kind of a dip like a like a little carved out area where you would get like if you remember that like little diagram I showed you would get you know head uh head wall erosion from surface runoff you would get the runoff happening and eroding that area you know a lot more creating coarser sediment and things downstream but that was very obvious once you got down in there just that how pronounced the plunge pool was and how things were the groundwater that was seeping out of that a uh, little screen there was like filling in that area. And so if you had, you know, overland flow of some sort, it would definitely be kicking up lots of dirt and sand. Um, but ooh, quite cool video. I didn't know this video was taken until I looked at our box folder and I was like, wait, this video is so cool. Um, great Utah landscape. And that's <laughs> us on that little like knob there for scale. There's three of us being swallowed up by this landscape like it, it was absolutely incredible but this is another example of like in a similar area maybe a couple canyons down um amphitheater heads and like if you look here you can see like a little baby channel flowing into whatever this is here um I think it might be like a joint of some kind or something something happening but you can see that there's a lot of stuff happening here. Um, similar, similar morphologies happening here, but it's really when you turn this corner that you open into this absolutely massive canyon um, that we couldn't even get to the edge to see because it was so scary. Like it was, it was, it was absolutely wild. And I mean, like, I think I have a picture next. Do I have another picture of it? I can go to the end. Um, yeah. But you see like a similar morphology, just that like alcove shape is just not, it's not super pronounced until you get here. I'm trying to make sure I, um, what's happening? Oh, there we go. No, okay, so I didn't include it. Um, I'll go back to it. But if you like at the, I think at some point it like pans down. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is irritating. I'm sorry, I'm not technologically savvy. So I'm not positive, but I think with like period and comma, you can like jump forward. Period and comma? I know, it's yeah. weird. Period and comma, you can skip forward by one frame at a time. You pause and it's paused, yeah. Okay. Oh wait, no, it's pausing and starting. Oh, well, okay. It was a thought. <laughs> that's okay. That I didn't know that. Working that. Yeah. New terms. This is cool. Okay, technologically sad. <laughs> um, I was trying to get to where you could see like there was another plunge pool at the bottom of this one, mm. which okay, you can see it a little okay. bit better here. There's a little like yeah. it's much smaller than the other one, but there is a punch pool. There's hanging gardens here where you get like this like minor little alcove and you get vegetation concentrated here. But it was really, it's just like a massive drop off between where the Navajo, you know, kind of cut like basically it's a nick point. Like think uh, like I like to think of it as it is a nick point. Um, but it's really pronounced just the elevation difference between, you know, the, where the top of the nick point is down to the bottom of where this L where this uh, plunge pool is. Super cool, really incredible. And this just looks so starkly different. Like the landscape around it looks so starkly different from, you know, the, the inside of this canyon. Like you, we didn't know, uh, we kind of knew it was there from the topo maps, but like there was just no way to understand the magnitude of it without, you know, going to see it for yourself. Or in this case, using the drone because we would have seen it for ourselves. But, um, Super cool. Next was the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. I think this area is called Height, but we were kind of referring, it, referring to it by one of the units uh, at the top here. 
I think this is called the right rim sandstone. It could also be the stuff that we were standing on. The stratigraphy here is quite, it's quite detailed. Um, but there was no drone flying here because it's a national recreation area. Um, and so that's quite prohibited. So we didn't want to, we didn't want to, you know, step on any toes, mess anything up for if somehow by miraculous, like conception, we were able to get a permit to fly drones here because the canyons were quite cool. Um, there is like this, like kind of thin layer here of the, some sandstone. And then you have, you know, things here and this like slope forming, um, weaker. So the same idea of like strong permeable layer over weak impermeable layer. And so you get this like cliff forming unit over this slope forming unit. Very cool, very awesome. But the canyon, which is me for size here, or me for scale, the, <laughs> way too cool. That's me trying to climb rocks to see if I could find a plunge pool. I couldn't get up there, it was quite scary. Um, but you really see at this like contact, you see the contact a lot easier here, a lot better here of this like, you know, kind of, it looks like it was freshly wet, um, but this like whitish layer here, and then this like reddish layer under it. Um, and at this like contact, you can see this like white stuff. That's all salt weathering from like seepage that's happening, um, like very slow time scales to get, you know, toponi. And so you can see the toponi very nicely here. And that's kind of how we were like looking at things of like, there's some kind of groundwater sitting here long enough, some kind of water that's sitting here long enough to be able to flake off in salt, we salt weather in this way, um, which you can see really well here. And so these canyons were quite cool. We didn't get any cool drone pictures like we did with the others, um, but these canyons were just incredibly large and very cool and had a lot of like massive boulders. Um, if you like see here, there's like chunks of, let me see. There's like areas where chunks of like entire like parts of the canyon were missing and like all the chunks were, here. And so as we were walking with the channels, you could very see, like very largely see like mass wasting of sorts. You get like massive just boulders falling, falling from like upper parts of it. But you can also see that they weren't as recessed. Um, so like they were propagating, but like it was the like the buttes and mesas and things that were really controlling, controlling how much uh, water was able to like how much surface runoff was able to flow over these like, you know, upper parts where the canyons weren't. And so like, if you were to look at this aerially, um, kind of from the top down, there's like very little surface left where the canyons haven't like recessed back. And so the drainage area is just non-existent to be able to produce or like to offer, you know, um, surface runoff that's sufficient to be able to form or, you know, continue to erode these back. but. They're quite cool and quite pronounced. And so like what is there is very large and very cool and shows similar uh, traits to what we were seeing in Hans Flat. And the last place we went to go look at was Tarantula Mesa, which is near the Henry Mountains. If anybody knows where that is, they're quite large peaks, uh, very cool. I think they're like platonic of some sort of origin. I'm not a tectonics person, but it's quite cool. Um, but these were also similar, but they were much larger. Like, uh, so what we saw in like the others and what I was showing in the others were kind of like this like two layer controlled, like you get alcove formation kind of at like one point um, where it's like highly recessed at one point. But here you get like multiple of these like alcove hanging garden things. Um, and they're like much more, I don't know what the, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here is, but like they're spread out over a larger like vertical area than they were in like in the other canyons. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I can't figure out what I'm trying to say, but there's like more cascading like steps mm -hmm. here than they were in other places. And I think, so these units here, here, um, so this like cliff forming unit here is interbedded. So it's like a largely a strong permeable layer, but there's interbedded muds that force, you know, little mini aquacludes to force uh, groundwater out at certain points. So you get like stair stepping, cascading um, 
kind of plunge pool, like alcove things happening, which ultimately feed into this like, you know, slope forming weaker impermeable layer here, which is pretty cool and was not seen at any of the other ones. Um, again, didn't have a drone to get like cool stuff, you know, cool aerial photos or anything or oblique photos of these, but you can kind of see really well like the slope or not the slope, the um, cascading things here. So like this is like the first one and then you get down a little bit further and there's another one down here. And then at the bottom of some of these were also plunge pools and like sandier stuff at the bottom, but largely here, this is the image I was looking for. So it was also a very cool example of a hanging garden where it's just like floating there. If you didn't like, if you didn't know any better or if you like didn't know what was going on, it's like, oh, it's floating. Um, which is what I, I kept saying, but um, very cool example of like, you know, what's going on and like how these things kind of interact with the lithology to form, you know, similar features and similar morphologies, just like depending on where the lithology sits and how um, the stratigraphy is kind of um, preserved, I guess you could say, how it like influences the hydrolog hydrologic processes. Um, but I believe that's the end. Um, basically, all this is to say that there's a lot, obviously, a lot of stuff going on in this area. Um, and it would really be interesting to understand, you know, like obviously, there's some component. There's groundwater is, has a large part in the morph overall morphology of this and the undercutting. So you get the alcove. But that, like I said, is not at all, it's visible in 3D. But the question is, is that also something that could be expressed in the 2D? Like, can we see, you know, from, can we use 3D metrics and 3D landform metrics to understand how we could possibly see if maybe these are also on Mars, you know, in the canyons there. Like, if we can see that there's some litho lithologic control happening with the groundwater and therefore informing the 3D morphology, basically, can we, like, is there any information in the 2D about what the 3D looks like? Um, and so broad plan, this is still like largely in the works. This was like recent work, um, but the broad plan is like, you know, get like really good remote sensing data and kind of measure where the contacts are in the head walls, which is like what you call like the, you know, beginning of the, like what we were looking at um, and understanding like, where these contacts happen and how that informs like the overall 3D morphology and therefore 2D plan form. Um, and kind of looking at like sediment. So like, is there a sediment um, relation to like how these form? And so is it because there's no coarse sediment upstream when you have these like sandstones, it's not making a whole bunch of coarse sediment. And so is that why you're getting these nick points? Um, and also un understanding like trying to quantify like the surface runoff. So like up, identifying upstream uh, channel drainages. So how many are there? Where are they coming from? Where's the largest one? And is that the way that the, can the canyons are kind of propagating? Lots of questions, hopefully many answers, who knows. <laughs> um, and then largely using all of these things that we're hoping to you know accumulate and gather to create canyon and landform metrics to be able to apply these canyons on Mars. So it's very difficult to see 3D, obviously, because we really have a bunch of like, you know, remote sensing data and the, the rovers are not currently in these areas. And so can we use these metrics that we are hoping to build on Earth to apply to Mars at all? And if that's the case, then that gives us a really large hope that we can constrain the lithology of the upper crust, which is not largely known currently and understand like, Okay, well, we know groundwater is playing a role, and we know surface runoff plays a role, and lithology plays a role. Is that all expressed in these canyons and their morphology? And can can they be used to inform of like processing control? But yeah, that's the plan. That's what's been done. Do I have any questions? Can I clarify anything? We have lots of time for many questions. Don't be shy. Anyone online too, if you want to unmute or raise your hand or type in the chat. I'll go right. um, so you, was this 
like feel we're successful like, kind of in identifying targets you want to come back to? Like, oh yeah, for sure. Right, yeah. Most definitely. Um, definitely starting with that like massive alcove one. Like I just like I I was re-looking at the pictures and like they were cool. Like it just does not do it justice. Like it's mm -hmm. just so large and it's like I think it was quite I spent so much time looking at like like I keep saying the 2D, but like this is like this is like nothing I could have imagined. Um and so definitely like this will be really useful. Uh this has been a similar like this area, the Colorado Plateau, like this area of the Colorado Plateau has been explored by quite a few people looking at like similar landforms. And a lot of them have talked about this alpha geometry, but it's kind of looking at them. So this is like the Navajo Kayenta contact and the others were different mm -hmm. points in contact along the stratigraphic column. And so seeing how that translates across, you know, different like higher or lower in the stratigraphic column basically will really help to understand how things are expressed across multiple lithologic contacts instead of just this one, but definitely we'll be returning. And we know we can get into this one and like a few of the others, um, which is something we were like, there was an area that like, um, one of the like first papers that proposed this, like these to be formed by groundwater sapping, um, they looked at like areas along the Escalante River and like, there is no need to those canyons unless without a multiple day like backpacking trip and or they used a boat to get like from the like Blank Canyon Dam up and then like to the Escalante and then like up. It's not possible because the, the dam is quite low these days and so it's hard to get up the, up the Escalante to like where the canyons are. But definitely, definitely we'll go back, um, which is planned sometime next year. Undetermined what it will be. Yeah. Um, I actually have a similar question. Do you think you'll look at like other field sites to see what is common or different from the like Utah mm -hmm. and Peter Valleys versus like, I don't know, do you guys go to field work in Hawaii? Is that what everyone's work? Um, it's not currently planned, but like, I don't know. The, like things always change and like things always happen. So like, I'm not like these are cool and I would like to go back, but if it would be possible to go and look at some stuff. I don't know. Yeah. That would be cool. But also, like, find it not. Like, could be a postdoc thing or yeah. something. Who knows? But, yeah. I have a question. Yes. It might be really niche. So if you don't want to answer it, just be like, not nah, dog. This is fine. Um, so I think, like, in your proposed, like, research toward the beginning, you are talking about, like, understanding what processes dominate. Mm -hmm. And my question is more, like, how do you know that was like the dominant mechanism if something else could have been more dominant at a different time? Like, are you more curious about like what was dominant toward the end of like all of this like rapid water cycling you know, before like it went all dry? Like how how are you gonna yeah, like how are you gonna determine that? I don't know. I I don't know if you can. Like okay, it's not saying. obvious to me if you can, it's more like it's like what's been proposed is like hard ends of the spectrum, you know, like mm. it's this or it's this, um, which is like, they mentioned like, you know, whether like for the surface runoff when that came out, it was like, oh, we think groundwater may be only secondary um, and that surface runoff really dominates. But I think it's more looking at it as like both, like we know both is happening. Like we know both has a large um, influence over like, the three D and like we know that there's both processes happening. It's just how we can use the like morphology itself to like constrain that is like largely up in the air, mm -hmm. which is like what has to be done for Mars specifically. Like we don't we don't know what's been going on or what are what's been going on what happened. Yeah. Um, and so it's like using these canyons and these landscapes to like really constrain them is what's. So I don't know if you can really say what's dominant or not. Um, Hopefully that becomes more obvious. I have possibly a naive question. Um, how old are the equivalent features on Mars expected to be? Like when was this pro when could this process have been active throughout Mars' geological history? Yeah. Um, and then off of that, just sort of like, okay, so how much erosion might have happened? How would the morphology look now compared to what is presumably very young here? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll probably have to ask for the second question again, but for the first question, 
it because it requires some form of surface runoff where that sits on the spectrum is you know TBD. It had to be when surface water was activity was you know happening. So anywhere I think it's like three point eight. It was like this estimate. I could be wrong. So please feel free to say. Okay. So please correct yeah, yeah. me. All right, all right. Um, this is like pre Amazonian. Yeah, like very, very early, like very, very early Mars history. Um, and so, yeah, it had to be when that was occurring. Right, okay. But like, so I don't really talk. I also have like another project that I'm doing of like modeling like the propagation of these based off of. Um, Drainage area, which I think is kind of HU. That's what I'll be talking about there. Um, and so there we kind of look at these. So, like, you have chasmus on uh, Mars, which I believe they're associated with like some kind of mega flooding outburst thing. I, again, like, I don't, that's not where uh, my expertise is. But I believe the idea is that you have some kind of hot stuff from the mantle or stuff in the, I don't know, in the mantle coming up and interacting with like uh, subsurface ice. And so it heats it and it breaks some cap ice rock that's like that's in the subsurface and expels all of this water out and like a massive, you know, outburst flood. And I believe that's a little after, or it's like at, towards the end when surface water activity was like really, really, you know, at its peak. Um, but you have these same landforms imposed onto those chasmas. Mm -hmm. And so really understanding like when things were, you know, at its peak and like how much water it took and things like that is important for not only constraining like past planetary habitability, but also like understanding, you know, when surface water activity was happening. So if, like this is, these are mostly surface runoff dominated, then that speaks, you know, mm -hmm. longer spells of surface runoff activity than is I believe to be currently expected, mm -hmm. but if it's groundwater, then that means that groundwater was kind of shifting as like a dominant thing as surface runoff activity was beginning to dissipate. And um, yeah, atmosphere stuff, yeah, stuff I don't really fully quite understand, but know is important. Yeah, does that answer your first question? I think that it's yeah, it's like it also kind of answers the second question a little bit, which is about you know, like these have been eroded by billion plus years of weathering on Mars. Yeah. So what would they look like now was my other question. Probably much more because there's like, so in my other project looking at like drainage area and how that like really influences um, like their propagation from the surface runoff side, mm -hmm. it would probably just mean that like at some point that like massive overspilling of like surface runoff, just like there was no more drainage area above it. And so looking at discrepancies of like, okay, if surface runoff is like the main dominant formation processes that you would expect, that there would still be some kind of drainage area above it, that they would kind of be formed at like similar times because they're all receiving mm -hmm. similar, you know, things like that. Um, then it should be predicted that like head wall retreat and like nape point retreat should be able to predict where the head walls are and where they could go. But if there's like discrepancies between that, then it could be explained by like groundwater contributions. And so that like, speaks to maybe like explaining a little bit of like, you know, it's both and like this is quantifying like, okay, gotcha. this is how much you need it. And if you want to keep propagating past where it is, like this is how you can do it with surface runoff, but also contributing groundwater, like how. Right. Hence the importance of characterizing them in the first place. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions? Clarifications about stuff I was saying and didn't really know what I was talking about. <laughs> Questions online? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is like a question you can answer. No, this is not. <laughs> Maybe unanswerable question. But I, I, like, I'm also working on it based on like the future work part. But like, what did these look like, like in the plane or whatever? Like they largely so like that's a great question actually. Is it same with your test? That was a great question. <laughs> they look like this. So like they they look like this like curved, you know, stubby like 
amphitheater, like if you will. Um, they just look like even like I didn't include it because this is a paper from like a, another person who wrote actually like the surface runoff paper. Um, he's done a, a ton of work on Earth, on Mars. Yeah, he's really he's in the cut wall. Like he's he's doing his work. Um, but there's like plunge pools and like some alcove stuff also, and like these channels. Um, Hawaii, I don't know so much. I it's difficult to get to these because they're like off the coast. So this is like the Kohala region, um, which I believe is a volcano. And so it's very hard to get to, densely vegetated. They're like this this uh scale bar is like three kilometers. They're incredibly deep, they're like so hard to hide. I don't even know how you get to like the top of the head walls. I don't, I don't know if anybody's done it. They did it by helicopter. And so I don't I don't have a helicopter. So I don't know how it's possible. Um next grant. Oh for sure. sure. That is <laughs> hearing from me. <laughs> um but they all look like this stubby like like I don't I don't even know like they're just stubby some of them are kind of elongated like they are in the sapping channels but most of them have that like stubby like amphitheater like plan for curved you know things like that but it is not obvious to me I should have included pictures of the region above it if you go let's see if I can get to it here like if you really zoom in like if you look in this area here, they have that like similar plan form of like just like stubby, like you know, steep walled. And so it was like not at all obvious that it was gonna be like that. I have no clue. And Google Earth, Google Earth still doesn't do the job. <laughs> it really does not do these canyons, Justin. They need to have the Google card get out there. Yeah, yeah. But instead of like <laughs> Google drone. And Google, uh, I'm sure they have it. Listen, if they're listening know, right now, listen. <laughs> That's this a great idea. You know, I do need a job. Uh, at some point in the future, and I would love to go Google drone. When we put the geoscience in Google Earth. Oh, it'll be over. It'll be over. Yeah. Accessibility. Yeah. Imagine how much work could be done on this if there was no, Google the drone. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. But... That's uh, that's the vibes. Super exciting. I quite love this area. It's so pretty. It's nice. Yeah. Well, let's thank Morgan one more time. Thank you all for joining this semester. I will be circulating a list for y'all to sign up next semester. I will prioritize those students who are graduating that need to do their PC talk first. Other than that, come share your science next semester. Bye, y'all. Bye.